test, test. There we go. Welcome everybody. Nice breezy evening with uh, the possibility of showers and we're hoping, we're hoping that the, the storm holds off until the Science Cafe is over. So thank you all for, for coming out despite the risk of rain. It's good, it's good to see the crowd. My name is Shippard Reed. I'm from the Flandreau Science Center and Planetarium. Um, for those of you who are new to Science Cafe, this is the last Science Cafe in our dopamine series called Everybody's Talking About Dopamine. Um, there's a lot of fascinating uh, neuroscience happening at U of A, and so much, much of it connects to dopamine. Um, for those of you who have been able to attend all of the cafes, it's, it's been fascinating, and uh, I think this final cafe also promises to, to uh, provide new insights into uh, how our brains work and how dopamine works in our brains. Before we get to the Science Cafe, I'm going to uh, make a plug for our new sharks exhibit at Flandreau Science Center and Planetarium. It's called Sharks, Magnificent and Malign, or Misunderstood, sorry, too many M words in my head. <laughs> Magnificent and Misunderstood, there's a lot of cool interactives with that, and we have in our planetarium theater, we have a show called Great White Shark, which is a full dome planetarium show, uh, all about great white sharks, um, and, uh, and the divers actually took the cameras down with the sharks, so that's really cool as well. Um, so, Flandreau, by the way, got a long summer ahead of us. If you're in town, it's a great place to come in the summer because it's nice and cool, and you can enjoy planetarium shows and find out what you're seeing in the night sky here in Tucson. And with that, I am very pleased to introduce Bob Wilson. He is an assistant professor in the Department of Psychology and he's also the director of the Neuroscience of Reinforcement Learning Lab at the University of Arizona. Can we get a big round of applause for Thank you. Thank you so much for having me here today. Thank you for coming out braving the, I know it's not really cold, right? But braving the, braving the weather. Um, so uh, I am Bob Wilson, I'm in the psych department uh, at, uh, at U of A. Um, and, and like Shippen said, I have a lab and my lab is called, we, had a, we actually had a rename. Uh, we renamed the lab the Neuroscience of Reinforcement Learning and Decision Making Lab. I renamed it for a very specific reason, so that I could kind of squint at it and turn it into this uh, acronym, which is the Nerd Lab. So we are the nerds, uh, these are the nerds. Round of applause for the nerds, thank you. Um, and we study reinforcement learning, we study decision making, we make computational models um, of, of all of that. Um, and really central to both of these things, to reinforcement learning and decision making, is uh, this molecule dopamine. So uh, if you've been to all of these science cafes, you probably know more about dopamine than I do at this point. You don't need me to tell you it's a molecule. Uh, it has uh, the shape and the structure, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, uh, and oxygen. Uh, you probably don't need me to tell you at this point that there is a dopamine system in the brain, um, and the dopamine system uh, really uh, sort of revolves around these uh, nuclei down here, the ventral tegmental area and the substantia nigra, that are, are the main sources of dopamine, at least the main source of dopamine that uh, we care about with reinforcement learning uh, and decision making. And you probably don't need me to tell you from just popular culture that dopamine is the, uh, the reward molecule, it's the pleasure center of your brain. And this actually was the title of, a, of an article in the Scientific American uh, in 1956 by Olds um, and uh, also the collaborator uh, Milner. So here, here they are. This is Olds, a picture from 1950s, and uh, Milner, actually a picture from the last couple of years. He only passed away last year. Um, they were both roughly about the same age. Um, so in the 1950s, they had this idea that dopamine was the pleasure center of the brain, and they thought that actually for, for very good reason. Um, because what these guys did is they uh, actually started to stick electrodes into uh, this area of the brain. The technology had just been developed where you could put electrodes deep into the brain and you could stimulate different areas of the brain uh, with electricity. 
So that's what they did. Um, so, you know, schematically in a human brain, you would do it like this. You would stick an electrode in, deep down, into the VTA, the SNC, somewhere around there, right? They were just kind of poking around in the dark in the 1950s. They didn't have MRI scans or anything to guide them. But they would stuck their electrodes down into those areas. Um, and then they started zapping those electrodes and seeing uh, what would happen. And they did this not in humans, but in, in rats. And they did it in this rather just beautiful setup where, well, beautiful or, or, or terrible, depending which, uh, how you look at it, where the rat has an electrode deep down in its dopamine areas. It's wired up with this wire that goes all the way back down to the lever that the rat can press. So the rat can press the button and it can zap its own dopamine cells. And from a behavioral neuroscience perspective, this is really interesting because then you can say, well, how much does the, does the rat like to zap himself versus do anything else, like eat food or, or whatever uh, other opportunities you give him? So here he is, he can complete the circuit, zap his own brain. It's a paradigm called uh, self-stimulation. And it's one of the most amazing uh, results, probably in all, of, in all of neuroscience, even now, uh, that when you put this electrode deep down in these dopamine areas and you give uh, these rats the opportunity to zap themselves, they will do it in some situations for 2,000 times per hour for a day. They only stop because they turn the current off, take the lever away, take them out of the apparatus. They would do it forever. So I made a little movie. They had a little picture. They're pictures of the rats uh, in there, in that original 1956 paper. Um, so I made a little GIF, just combining those two things. Here's the thing, pressing the button about once a second this was basically an experiment for 24 hours just doing this. Just over and over and over again for 24 hours. Incredible, right? Why would you do something over and over and over again for 24 hours? Well, maybe because it's the pleasure center of the brain, right? You're hitting the pleasure center of the brain in some way. And what they did was all sorts of really beautiful experiments where they saw that, you know, depending exactly where you put it, you'll get slightly different effects. You put it in one area and the animal is hungry, he'll do this more than if he's not hungry. They, then they had this crazy experiment, as if you couldn't think this experiment, you know, is, couldn't imagine anything less ethical than this. Um, <laughs> they found that one way you could attenuate this effect uh, was by castrating the rats. So <laughs> castration, uh, reduces the effects of this brain stimulation. There we go, ow, so there we go. Um, so really, just this incredible, uh, incredible result. Um, and so this was sort of the picture in the mid 20th century that rats can be made to uh, gratify the drives, hunger, thirst, and sex by self-stimulation self of their brains uh, with electricity. And the idea here, if you want to represent this with an equation to sum it up, you would say dopamine equals reward. And that was really the picture for uh, much of the, of the sort of mid uh, 20th century. The other thing that's so beautiful about this article is it's in Scientific American in the 1950s. Because it's in Scientific American, there are all these ads and all these incredibly interesting ads from the 1950s about science products that you could buy, like, you know, two nitro propane, you wanted to buy that, or omite axial lead vitreous enameled resistors. Um, they are great if you're wire wound resistor, uh, you need, a, need one for a tough job. Uh, Monsanto was around in the 1950s. Uh, they weren't uh, genetically modifying things at that point. They were worried about uh, making non-fermentable starch. I know, apparently that would be useful for you. Okay, that was an aside. <laughs> to remind you that we're in the 1950s. The 1950s dopamine equals reward is the story. And that was the story until the late 80s, the early 90s when this guy came along, Wolfram Schultz, and he said, well, if dopamine equals reward, then I should be able to measure the activity of dopamine neurons, and it should tell me something about reward. 
So if dopamine equals reward, then uh, dopamine neurons should fire like crazy when I'm getting a reward. And because he's a smart guy, he also thought, well, you know, maybe they'll even fire when I'm predicting a reward. Not when I just get a reward, but when I'm, I see something that predicts I'm gonna get a reward in the future. So Wolfram's experiment, this is now moving from rats into, into monkeys. I'm illustrating it in the human brain just to keep everything the same anatomical diagram. Stuck in a red electrode, a recording electrode this time, not a stimulating electrode, in the VTA, the ventral tegmental area, one of these main centers of dopamine neurons. And he did uh, a very simple experiment. He gave the monkeys reward at a random time. And the reward was a drop of juice, squirted into their mouth, not you know, the most uh, amazing reward you could imagine, um, but, but he gave it to them. And what he did was measure the dopamine uh, response. And so what I'm gonna plot here, it's gonna appear in a second, is the dopamine response over time. And so these little ticks here denote half a second, here's one second, here's two seconds. Those times will become uh, apparent in a second what they mean. Uh, but the reward is delivered uh, at this point, at time 1.5 seconds. And then if you look at the dopamine response following that reward, what you see is, well, there's a little bit of firing here, they're firing a little bit, but then you get the reward and whoosh, you get this big dopamine response, this basic burst of dopamine firing. This is beautiful, right? This is exactly uh, what we would have said in the 1950s. Dopamine equals reward. But like I said, Schultz was smart and he remembered all the way back to the beginning of the 20th century to uh, Pavlov's dogs, right? So Pavlov's dogs, I'm sure you've heard of this famous experiment. Pavlov would ring a bell, and this is actually one of the dogs that was stuffed um, afterwards. So this is actually one of Pavlov's dogs. Um, it's in a museum in Russia somewhere. Um, he would ring a bell and then he would give the dog food. He would ring a bell and give the dog food. And ring a bell and give the dog food. And eventually he would ring the bell, and that's what this thing is right here, is he would measure the saliva and the animal would, would salivate to the sound of the bell, not to the food. It would salivate to the bell, it would also salivate to the bell, to the food, but it would salivate to the bell in, in sort of anticipation of the food that was coming. It would learn to predict the food. And so what Wolfram Schultz did was say, okay, let's do this in this monkey experiment. Not quite so, you know, Pavlov's technology was bells. In the 1990s, the sort of cool thing was fractals, fractal patterns. So he used fractal patterns as a stimulus. He showed it on screen, one of these fractal patterns. Whoa. <laughs> Don't blow it. He showed this fractal pattern on screen. And then about a second or so later, he gave them the reward completely predictable. So what happens now? What happens when you can predict the reward is gonna come? Well, if this is a reward neuron, you should get a burst of firing, right? Just like you got to the reward alone, the unpredictable reward. But that's not what he saw. What he saw was this, nothing. Big fat zero, right? The dopamine neuron is firing at some baseline rate doesn't change in response to the reward that it can predict. And let's just contrast that with the reward that you cannot predict. You get this big burst, just to make it clear. Big burst completely goes away when I give you a stimulus that predicts it. Well then what happens to the stimulus? Right, what happens at the time of the stimulus? If I go back in time to the time of the stimulus, you see the dopamine response has moved back there. Right, so just like the dog salivating to the bell, the monkey's dopamine neurons are responding to the thing that predicts the reward, not the actual reward itself. This is not a reward neuron, right? Dopamine is not reward. It's completely inconsistent with this result. Then, you know, neuroscientists are sadists, I think, so he did sort of the, the sort of um, negative experiment, and he said, well, okay, I'm gonna teach the monkey to expect reward, and then, I'm gonna take the reward away. So I show it the stimulus, it expects a reward, and now what happens when it gets no reward? And what you see is, well, it looks similar at first until you realize, hey, look at this, the dopamine neuron completely stops firing. 
when it's missing the reward. And just to contrast this with the predicted reward, you can see there's baseline firing, the unexpected omission, right? I sort of steer, take the reward away when you're expecting it. You get this negative prediction error, right? This is a really incredible set of findings. So I'll just summarize them all on one page. You've got the unpredicted reward, then you get the big burst. You've got the predicted reward, no firing to the reward, but lots of firing to the thing that predicts it. You've got the unexpected omission, big firing to the thing that predicts reward, negative response to the missing reward. You're expecting something and you don't get it. And what this led to, a little bit of thought, a little bit of help from some theorists, was a new equation, not dopamine equals prediction error, dopamine equals reward, it was dopamine equals prediction error. Dopamine is prediction error, right? Here, an unexpected reward, I get a reward I'm not expecting, it's a prediction error, a positive prediction error. Here I'm expecting a reward and I get it, okay, there's no prediction error. Here I'm expecting a reward and I don't get it, it's a negative prediction error. And this result, this idea that dopamine is a prediction error is probably the greatest